The first topic, as I have told you, is about um, strength training for triathlon. The first person who will come to speak to us is Darren Smith, and he is a, a regular here at INSEP. About 15 years ago, he was already here for an international congress on triathlon. So to introduce him just in a few words, he is a, a world-renowned triathlon coach. Just to give you a few names of those he's coached, well, Nor Lisa Norden, who was a medalist at the London Games. He also coaches Sarah Groff, and he has um, worked with Chris McCormick, and I think everybody need, knows him. We don't, he doesn't need an introduction. Darren is a scientist. That was his first um, degree, and in Australia, that's what he did. And so he will talk to us about strength training for high-level triathletes. So please give a warm round of applause to Darren Smith. I'll try not to move too much while I do my presentation, but I tend to move a little bit for demonstrations and so forth. Um, look, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you very much to the organizers. Uh, as has been mentioned, um, I did a presentation here in uh, 1999. We were, a few of us have probably been to that, that presentation. It was about the power outputs of the Sydney Olympic course. And I guess I was a sports scientist at the time working through the AIS in Australia. Um, I was just making the transition to coach. Uh, I knew there was a coach inside of me, uh, maybe slightly better than the sports scientist I was. And, um, I worked with some colleagues from the Institute here, the INSEP, Chris Harsworth, who's been mentioned. Uh, I've always admired the, the French Federation for their foresight in doing research. Uh, the INSEP colleagues, who, who largely did most of that work, I guess. Um, other French scientists, Grégoire Mellet, uh, Romuald Lepers, some of these guys pioneered the, the work looking at uh, transitions, running economy, those sort of things. Uh, I, the subjects in our study with Christoph didn't turn up, so I ended up being the guinea pig uh, in a little velodrome. It was particularly steep. If you get a chance to see it, it's still in the complex here, I understand. And it was a little bit scary the first few laps. It's only about 200 meters around, which means the the angle of the velodrome is really, really steep, and anything under about 35 k's an hour meant that you were going to slide off it. Anyway, I digress. Um, I call this uh, presentation the mysterious um, case of strength in triathlon, and uh, my esteemed colleague Inigo is going to talk to you in a little while, probably more on the scientific basis, uh, some practical information, but I'm going to draw upon some experiences from that time in 99, uh, fractionally earlier indeed, um, and to not provide too many answers to questions, but mainly go through my learning process and then also the way I overcome some of these uh, questions that I had. Sometimes you have plenty of expertise at your disposal, sometimes you don't really have any. You have to do mini experiments with your athletes and even yourself to try and understand some of these things. So that's the first bit, uh, the problem solving and the thought process, some of my challenges, and then an update as to where we are now, what, what we current, I currently know, my team knows. Uh, I, can't seem to get, I can't seem to get out of my head the fact that I'd like my athletes to be reasonably good athletic specimens. So, what does that mean? I think if you go to a gym class, and I've seen my niece go to her, her gymnastics class, she's 11, 
she does tumble turns and she can jump a bit and she can stand on one foot strong and so forth. I often think of uh, whether, you know, I just can't get out of my head the fact that I'd really like my athletes to probably go into a 11 year old gym class and not look totally out of place, falling over. For me as the coach, not to be too scared about them doing a tumble turn on the ground, a roll, even a, a, ha you know, even a headstand or something like that. And the other one I, that springs to mind is, what about the lateral movements of a soccer game? I've had some athletes that I've been a little bit you know, worried about perhaps even playing a game of touch rugby or soccer with. So, you know, ever since my early days of coaching, I've always had this uh, feeling that they should be at reasonably good athletic specimens, and indeed some of them haven't been, uh, which we might find doesn't really reflect uh, a poor athletic ability at triathlon, which is a very linear sport, but I just can't get that, that concept out of my head. Uh, I want to always try and push for developing somebody who's got some of these qualities. The other one is always try and have a common sense approach. And I, I've always uh, read things, I've always seen things, but I've always tried to come back to how am I going to apply it. Uh, the other thing, you know, we see lots of information and I guess we need to clarify at some stage we have to, otherwise we get totally lost. One point I would make mention of that's important is um, instead of holding a plank, most of us know what a plank is these days uh, in the gym for two minutes and then four minutes and then six minutes, sometimes it's more important to overload in terms of quality of act activity, make it more difficult rather than make it longer. So I would mention that in, in, in my overarching philosophy. We also want to make this a timely experience we only have a certain amount of energy, so we want to make this fast, give us the best return on our investment, and finally, I guess, relevance and timeliness. When do we implement, and how applicable is it to the individual? So this is a busy slide, but bear with me. I started off as a bit of a novice triathlete in the early 90s. I could run a bit. I couldn't run a uh, cycle too well, uh, but I could swim a bit a little, a little bit as well. The first year I remember having, well, my PhD supervisor was a, a power lifter, a master's power lifter and bench presser. And so we had a real interest in gym work. And so indeed I took up some gym work. It was the very standard sort of stuff. I was really quite strong in the gym that year. I went out and did my triathlon and I was spinning along uh, it's about 36 kilometers an hour. It was okay, not too fast for a young guy, quite fit, who could run just a bit over 15 minutes for 5Ks. And, and you know, there was this discord. I could never seem to push the big enough gears to go much quicker. I always was spinning and I was quite weak despite being able to do things like leg presses and certain standard gym exercises. In So there was this discord. Uh, I was fit quite good, but I was really quite slow on the bike. What I found out was muscular endurance is one of the key attributes of cycling performance. So you can be aerobically very fit, but if you haven't got some strength, and some of our sports are strength endurance based. Swimming, cycling, and running, I wouldn't say is strength endurance based. It's more other qualities. Year two, I went back and I did some overgear work, so very functional work on the bike. I dropped the amount of gym work a fraction. I didn't do such basic exercises. Uh, I did a little bit more of the cross-training type version back then. And lo and behold, I improved my muscular endurance. I improved my bike capacity. But one piece of warning about getting stronger, I was one day in a race looking down to see if I had another gear and I was already in the biggest gear in my bike. So I'd become very strong, but I hadn't yet been able to use clarity to know which gear to push. I had the capability of pushing a big gear, so I kept on using and looking for another one. And of course, my running ability dropped off in those particular races. So that was just a, an experiment of my own. 
I was working at the AIS a few years later, and I did the strength and conditioning level one course. And those times, uh, there was not much talk about endurance sport, very little. It was totally lifting based. It was very much gym. It was only the power sports. And I remember coming out of it going, well, what about us? What about me? At the time, I, being a sports scientist, I had a few athletes on the side. I was able to have the time to research what the Russians were doing. I read all of the bomper books, all of the periodization, all of the, the strengths type books at the time. Also some very smart people on what was just becoming relevant. The internet uh, had uh, SIF and, and a few other you know, pretty smart people were, had some in, in sight, but there wasn't very much to run on. Um, very fortunate for me, being in those positions of sports scientists at the AIIS, I worked with 15 different sports. So it went from the endurance sports to right through to combat, even as far as archery and shooting. And so I was able to speak to a lot of coaches and watch and listen a lot of training. And that helped me get a, a big background of knowledge across many sports, even though at the time we didn't know, I didn't think we knew a lot about uh, cross-training endurance sports. In the 90s, uh, later 90s and 2000s, I guess I moved into uh, running a program as a manager, the QAS program, which is still running today in Australia. Uh, I had a, a squad of my own, one or two really good athletes. Uh, I guess we in Australia heard of the concept of the core when about 97, I would coached an American and San Francisco was the place to do core before that for a year or so, and so I started implementing core training within our training program. But it wasn't simply a matter of uh, we need to do this once or three times a week. I actually did little experiments with myself and my squad to find out what was going to be most optimal. And what, what indeed, we were doing hill reps. Three times a week we'd do some core work, standard bridging and various other things. We found that instead of our body being pulled up the hill, after our strength and core work, we were able to feel like we had a very solid core and we were able to push our body up the hill. So whether it was recruitment of the glutes and a, and a variety of other things, a more stable midriff platform, we found that really helpful at the time. But I also did an experiment to see how much we could get away with. Would one session per week be enough to maintain it? How quickly would we lose those feelings? And indeed, one session really wasn't quite enough. So my thought process was take information that I find, do mini experiments to see what actually works and uh, just apply it. Um, a few years later, we, we saw yoga and Pilates and one of my better athletes at the time, Jackie Gallagher, uh, who was not very supple. We were trying to improve her swimming and her thoracic range and various other things just to make small gains. We, we implemented core, uh, Pilates, yoga, and those sort of things. Again, they were very new back then, and we didn't really know too much about it. We had, a, had the chance to do some physio screens for the first time, and we were starting by just making up physio screens. We didn't really know too much about what we were looking for, and myself, I brought in the first use of kind of the video camera, uh, it was only 60 hertz, 60 frames per second. It wasn't high resolution particularly, but it was enough for us to see some of the things. If we jump off this bench, we land in a certain way, what can we, what, what can we see and how does that relate to the physio's findings when, and that helps us problem solve a little bit more. So about that time, I brought in some of these things. And being the manager, I thought, this is gonna be great. I'm gonna run some programs, I'm gonna run some uh, lectures, and I'm going to help people do some little bit interesting things like working on scapular stability so that you can hold the catch better in swimming. But unfortunately, nobody in the QAS was particularly interested. The athletes at the time were really great at hard training. Uh, I wanted to help facilitate them to learn more, but I think I only got one person turn up at one of the seminars so that the, that one person, their, their coach, 
myself and the physio, who was, who was really a great physio with great insight into sport, uh, had a great round table discussion, so I figured, well, at least somebody got something out of it. But at the time, it wasn't really a priority at all. I guess I went from manager to coach, and that gave me a chance to implement a number of things by myself, and it was all up to me. In Scotland, we didn't have a lot of physios that knew about screening. In fact, nobody did. So uh, we didn't have great strength and conditioning expertise. So that meant that if I couldn't draw upon too many others, I had to come up with experiments, a way of ways of working and, and things that we could use. It just so happened near the swimming pool was a great little room. Nice floor, monkey bar, a mirror, a big mirror, uh, a little bit of uh, rubber on the, on, the, on the ground that we could move in, a few uh, weighted balls and stretch cords and a few things like that. And we went about playing. At the time, we just picked a group of the body, a muscle group, an area. Uh, we did the screenings. We picked a group. And for instance, you know, there might be three exercises for glute med. Do we do the same one every single time, or do we pick one for this session and pick another? It does the same relative muscle group. Um, the athletes don't get totally bored. The coach doesn't get totally bored from demonstrating and doing exactly the same thing. So we just picked muscle groups and just made sure that we went through the whole body. At the time, we had a little bit of specific work from our e investigations that each athlete could do to get better. They were like little projects for themselves, just individual. There was also a core group of exercises that would maintain our body. And think for yourself, if you don't do uh, an exercise in your body for X many weeks, does it reduce? If it's, not if it's a little bit supplementary to our sports, if it's not quite related to running, cycling, and swimming, how many weeks does it take before you lose that quality? So I figured that we'd come up with an easy exercise routine, covers most of the important bits that we may not use in a, a normal working, running, cycling, swimming week, and that would help us. And I was really quite happy. The athletes weren't amazing. Some of them went on to become quite good at long course and so forth, Bella Bayless, uh, Katrina Morrison, some have become coaches, Kevin Clark in Canada and so forth, um, managers, specialised, Gavin Noble and so forth. So I was quite happy with how we got from uh, not much knowledge to a basic good program that just took about 13 to 15 minutes a week or three times a week that we had access right next to the pool. It was easy. We didn't have to pay extra money. We went straight from one to the other. You know, it, fitted, it fitted us quite nicely. I did go back to some strength work again, lifting, some hang cleans at the time, and I didn't want to spend a lot of time on it because uh, I just wasn't convinced that it was the way to go. But one thing in particular I remind, reminded myself of was the hang cleans, which is really grab, grabbing a bar and lifting it in one movement. It's a whole body exercise, but I was particularly interested in what happens when you lifted and landed. And I could see some people landing with knees out of alignment and so forth. And so I, I sort of took that message and I thought, okay, that's a whole body movement, but actually I think it's pretty useful for how you land and what your alignment's like. I was working in the British system and I went to a world-class conference and there's a Welsh physio from Australia originally who came up in 2003, I think it was, with the concept of prehab. And I really liked that one. Instead of waiting until our athlete was injured and then we went to the physio and then we got rehab, I was particularly interested in her concept of bulletproofing the athlete, making them, and this is practically what I'd already started embarking on, which was good. 
I built up a lot of knowledge in my own skills, uh, biomechanics, rehab, I can treat people, I can dry needle, I can fascia or release, I can do all of those sort of things, mainly because I didn't have too much expertise at the time to help me. Vern Gambetta, an American out of Florida, came up, has, has sort of uh, pushed the concept of functional training, which kind of means you start from the base, you work on the bits that really need working, the whole body functions at, a, at, a, at, a, at one unit, you don't break it down into micro units and improve each one of those specifically, you don't miss bits and so forth. So all of these had influences on me putting things together in the future. A few years later I started the, what's become the D-Squad and it's been pretty successful over the years. We started with just a small group we basically, we basically just had uh, whole body exercises, a mixture of dynamic movements, multi-joint, single joint, some static work, uh, some sports specific work, over gearing on the bike, some paddles, some extra resistance when running sometimes. And then I started playing with this concept of off-road running. I figured there were some people in the group that still couldn't stand on their one leg for more than about five seconds before falling over and having to touch the ground. So I came up with this 60 second rule. I wanted my athletes to be able to handle 60 seconds, eyes closed, hands by their side, both before and after a hard run. After a hard run, much harder, but still that was the target because I figured there was something in that. The best athletes always seem to have this ability to react off the ground, to produce force, directed into the ground, and that's the way they run. Sprinters are a little bit different. The Kenyans, the, they really give the ground some oomph. They're not afraid of the ground, and you have a short period of time to do something with the forces from gravity, with the forces from the elastics we have stored within our body if we use it properly, and also some of the, the right recruitment of glutes and so forth. And so, you know, that was part of my learning uh, I, I took my athletes to uh, a little training camp that I started in southern Spain. It was in Aguilas in the early 2000s, and I remember picking this spot. And the trails were really rough. They were jumping off platforms like this on our long run. They were through sand, deep sand, over little dry creek beds. We really felt pretty rough on the first few weeks, you know, people falling over and not really stable and so forth. But I guess we became better at it. I went back to the Scottish program and I did some testing and we saw our running economy improve after that block. But again, I went back and I ran through the Scottish hills, fells very similar to this terrain here, hilly, jumping over puddles. And I thought, well, would that keep those qualities. And I did another set of testing and I found that it didn't keep those qualities. We went back for another camp in this rugged terrain of the Spanish coastline and again we picked up the skills easier than the first time. So something was there, there was motor, the motor patterns were there, they were just a little bit rusty. We picked them up earlier and quicker than what we did the first time and then you know, my athletes seem to then run better after that. So I was playing with the environment as well at the time. I'll just go through a couple of the, the four athletes that I had in the program at the time, 2006, 2007. Some you might recognize, some maybe not. On the left there, you've got um, the first, first picture. You've got Daniela Reef, who was in our program from under 23s. Now, I'm particularly proud of her on this day, she ran with Snowzel for 5Ks out of the 10Ks, for, which was quite an achievement for somebody who was a medium level runner, but a very strong athlete. Some alignment problems, but very strong and stable athlete. Good athletic specimen. We have Lisa with her little Japanese friend. Uh, Lisa came from a horse riding background, so had no background in running. She was, she'd done some touring in Italy with her mum on cycling, but never really been a swimmer.
but what she brought from horse riding, which is, you know, working the horse, feel, learning, together as a team, she was able to learn swimming, actually easier than others. She was able to learn, and I think part of that was the ability that she learned when she did her horse riding uh, earlier in, in her life. We've got Carolyn Murray, who's pictured there winning what was the World Series equivalent in South Africa, I think 2008. And she's a very well-muscled young lady, and this is after we'd uh, dropped her muscle mass a little bit. But the range of motion wasn't particularly good, despite having all of that strength, so I had to improve her swimming. Uh, I had to improve the specific strength qualities that you need in swimming. And it wasn't about muscle bulk to make you go faster. Many of you know that. It's about holding the water, the right tension, providing the right paddle and core, and all of these combined together. So we had a, the most ma muscular athlete I've probably coached, yet uh, was one of the weaker swimmers at the time and needed improving. And then the other one that I was coaching for about 18 months to two years was Kate Allen after she'd gone in a bit of a slump after the Olympics. And she to me is the, probably the best runner that I've actually worked with, the most stable athlete except for Chris McCormack around the core and really a very strong and controlled athlete, hard working, uh, but the body type was very robust. The only thing I ever saw was a, re a little bit of plantar fasciitis, but a, a really strong, well-aligned athlete who could do lots of work. So we then moved on to the Beijing to London cycle, and this is really when I got the opportunity to work with some highly talented athletes. And these athletes, the, the group that I took to the Olympics plus Barbara Viros uh, and, and a number of others ha will go on and become, I think, are known internationally as, you know, a very talented group. And they've continued that trend of good performances with other coaches, that is. It was the time of bringing in more expertise. So instead of downsizing, I increased the size of my, my team that helped our athletes. I brought in full-time physios. Uh, there was one physio, we were able to micromanage, you know, the, the loads a little bit better, more expertise, more people. This was in the, the mid-2000s, um, or late 2000s. Uh, one of the athletes, uh, one of the coaches, sorry, I brought in an assistant coach who'd been a dancer. And I brought in a physio who had just been working with the Sydney Dance Company. And I was inter interested in dancing because when you look at somebody, uh, they're a dancer, you know, they've got good lines, they've got a good alignment, they've got actually a lot of strength. If you were up near the stage and some, a dancer was here, you'd hear a, a real thump into the ground. From the back of the, back of the, sta uh, back of the auditorium, you'd see them float into the air, but actually they provide a lot of force and so I was very interested in the alignment aspects, the strength aspects, the range of motion aspects, and I thought that could help our sport. And then I also brought in another uh, physio at another time uh, later in that cycle who was very much from a power sport background, a more strength and conditioning type of uh, fellow. I was coaching athletes from many countries, so I had plenty of opportunity to talk with the best sports scientists of that country and I'd already been a sports scientist so I'd already had plenty of contacts anyway. Did that help me? Actually sometimes it made me more confused, uh, hence the, the title. Uh, too much input. This was the time where you know strength and conditioning had gone from the power sports only to really starting to move into the endurance sports. So you know my word of warning is I had lots of experts to talk to. I would send an athlete back home, they might get screened, they might have their own physio for their own federation, they'd come back with a series of exercises, some of which, you know, they, they were told to do, uh, some of which we reviewed, some of which I was scratching my head about, some of which made a lot of good sense and really added to what we did. So too much information sometimes doesn't clarify things, it makes a mess, and that's one of the 
the things I learned from that phase. Uh, and of course, being a decent level coach who's interested in exploring, you get opportunities to see other sports, other high level competitors, see what the coaches do, what they're implementing, especially the ones who are pretty good at innovating. So a few photos finally. What did we do in that phase? So it's not a list of exercises because I don't think that helps really anyone. A list just gives you a basic list and you don't really know the reasons why. We basically did a mixture, an eclectic, interesting group of exercises. We, we overlaid the skills and the alignment and those sort of things at every opportunity I could possibly think of. So, you know, complex sets where you, you do some strength work and then you overlay some plyometrics or ballistic exercise while well, you add skill to that. You know, there's a whole range of different ways of doing it. Bottom line, we did the basics well. We try not to get too confused. We kept the athletes healthy and on the road and uh, we, we also made sure that we had good alignment. Just, just talking to a couple of the, the photos there um, on the top right hand side you've just got us having a meeting we've got the massage therapist the physio with the dance background the the assistant coach who also was a dance coach me you can see the mountains in the background we picked mountainous villages roads all different roads flat hilly off-road crazy off-road you name it uh, i remember daniela reef and i doing a um, fight leg on a, a road that I was scared on, was scared about run, falling over, and I was pretty good at these sort of things. We didn't have a gym in Davos. We didn't have a gym. We used the side of the pool. We used some grass areas near the lake. But you can see there the physio and the coach are there. There's high attention to detail. This is Bart Arnott from those of you who are from Belgium. Uh, who's a long-distance athlete now. Uh, Lisa Nord is helping him, trying to pull a cord from underneath his, his back. It's one way of trying to keep some core stability by you know, not letting your, your partner pull the cord from underneath your back. So we're playing games. And then also we've got a couple of the, the girls there. When we went to Kenya, I got input from specialist coaches who did exercise, interesting exercises. We got the chance to see people who are, from a young age, very, very strong, who had the wiring for great proprioception. And what I mean by that is, inbuilt in their body is a wiring system that allows them to have great control over their, what their feet do. They're not afraid. None of the ground in Itan, Kenya, is flat. It's up and down, and it's brutal, and they don't look like they're running up or down. They simply uh, float the whole way. We, Caucasians, a little bit stiff old coaches, we break on the downhill and do our best just to get up the uphill. The Kenyans just look like they float along. The bottom line is we did nothing that particularly fancy. Just a few lessons, just to finish up the first bit of the presentation, then some questions. You know, I said that I wanted to have somebody capable of having a soccer game or, you know, going to the gym. Not every athlete is good at gym. There's some, a couple of gold medalists that I can recall that are really poor in the gym can't do basic exercises particularly well, but go exceedingly fast. So it's not that you have to be able to do gym exercises for kids. You don't need that. You need to go fast. And I am reminded that the sport is about going fast in a linear motion, but I would argue that their longevity in the sport may be at question. You might get one Olympic cycle out of them, maybe two, but perhaps three and four, you know, long, long careers would be at jeopardy if they didn't have uh, a chance to build up some of these basic physical abilities. I still have athletes that fall over years after 
uh, working with them. I still have them, you know, close your eyes and they're falling over. Uh, some are actually great runners. So proprioception, alignment, land with a straight knee, straight foot, do not buckle, don't let your knee, don't pronate too much. Yeah, it's difficult. It's not, it's not implementing a program for two weeks and telling them to do something well. It takes really a lot of time. And I'll, I'll speak to that in a, just one second. We've traditionally tried lifting. We found some athletes really found it detrimental to their program because they were sore. So they were sore. They were still sore when they were four weeks into the programs doing some of the lifting. Some of the exercises still made them a little tight and sore. Uh, we didn't get that much from it, uh, unfortunately. I know others swear by it. Chris Pallone, uh, Hamish Carter. It's the one little secret they never told anyone. Lifts. You know, it gives that person who is really linear, really well conditioned, clean, good skills, what he felt was a strength position and, and an edge. Uh, we, we've never quite found that. I've, I've had some good experiences, but not across the board. We often move towards trying to have some freedom of motion when we're doing exercises. So people are doing lunges with uh, cords attached to them. Uh, what's wrong with doing a, an exercise that uh, is free, that you need to use your proprioception and your stability aspects? Well, sometimes it doesn't work so well for some people. And so for a number of people, we've gone back to the old days and isolated exercises maybe with the Smith machine, which is one of those, those ones that basically stop you from falling over. So you're really just isolating something, but then we'd go straight into what would be a dynamic movement, a sport-specific movement after that. So we wouldn't just isolate it and do nothing with it. We'd isolate it, five minutes. Uh, we'd isolate it and do something with it, uh, rather than just go free weights. When somebody's training a lot already, implementing other things is, in theory, going to be helpful, isn't it? To the point where we have to wonder what the risk is of injury. An example, somebody who's been doing 60 to 80 k's of running, we take that up over the winter, we want to do 100. They get up to 120. Where's the point where it's then safe to bring in some of the depth jumps, the plyometric ac activities? Is it risky to both increase mileage and to increase, you know, it's the time for bringing in some of these things, but mileage is increased, how risky is it? You know, these are all of the things we need to, on a practical level, try and work out. You can't do absolutely everything in our sport. I've just got five minutes to go. Just a couple of case studies. Uh, these, if you look at this picture, there's three girls. I want you to focus on the ones that I was coaching for the last few years. There's, there's really not that much difference, would you agree, in the, the running styles? Can anyone pick much of a difference? Anyone pick a difference? Very subtle, I think, the right foot of the girl Aileen Reed. The angle it's projected compared to Aileen, perhaps the alignment, but there's not much to it. Do they look very similar in terms of body shape? I would say yes. Similar height, muscularity, lean. That particular day, Aileen outran Jody, but not by that much. So I'll just go through those, those girls when I first started working with them and, and what we've been doing since. So Jody is relatively poor gym ability and interest. In fact, not interested at the time at all. Uh, quite poor at it, not very good at stable exercises, very static exercises, not very good at all. Planking, bridging, those sort of things. But if you put her on a cross-country course and ask her to run downhill, 
she's great. The core is stable. So functionally, there's a lot going on and it's working well. In the gym, though, in our attempt to even make it better, we found out that she was really very rough. Uh, stride length and her ability to apply depth, what we call depth or force generation into the ground was very good, very strong. And she had a comfort with the ground. You've seen those athletes that are not comfortable with the ground. Have you? Yeah, you can see that. The, the strength and power athletes, the runners, are pretty comfortable. They apply large forces. Some of our athletes, certainly as juniors, with not very good alignment, not very good proprioception, will actually be a little bit timid on the ground. They won't really give it anything. And, uh, and, but she had, despite being uh, relatively rough in the gym. She did have poor single leg. So relative to her double leg jump height, we use accelerometers to test some of these things. Her single leg, as a function of double, was relatively poor, so we've made gains on that. Because running's not about two legs at a time, is it? It's about one at a time. And you can see these things from the Origin Project and, and all of these other programs, how they focus on those aspects. Then we've got Aileen Reed, who joined us in 2013. At the time, uh, I would say she was a great gym athlete had come from the Irish program who had a very sophisticated uh, network and good programming, coaching, complex. But her calves were in pieces. We had to stop. We had to get injections. The myofascial borders between gastroc and soleus were shot to pieces. She'd run on her toes for too long. She'd done probably too much plyometric work. And the career wasn't going to last. So we had to take a step back, teach her how to run a little bit differently, and so forth. But the point is, she was super. But I asked her, I found out about three weeks into our program that she was actually doing her long runs on the footpath in Canberra. Not in all the great trails, the dirt trails, just like here, you know, dirt trails everywhere, through forests, like everybody else in the squad. She was fearful of tripping over and twisting her ankle. Such was how poor her stability was in a practical sense. Her previous coach had let her. I said, no, 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 this is not going to do. In the end, three years later, she was doing hill reps and running up and down hills like it didn't matter, and I think it made some uh, improvements to her. She came to us with a really short, sharp, uh, small stride for her size. Everybody else at that size, at that speed, had about 30 extra centimetres her stride length, and she had very small, so we addressed that aspect. She was very fearful of the ground, despite being our most, most dedicated, the best looking athlete. If you went to the gym and you said, you didn't know the athletes and you said, uh, now that's the strong one. And indeed, she was strong in the gym, but practically there was a, a big number of limitations. So within, with one minute to go, there is just not one recipe. I'll just put up a couple of lists here. One list, Kate Ledecky's whole body training program. It's got, you can do this later, you can have a look later. Uh, you know, the top exercise is actually with a machine like the old days that sit in the not very good gyms. You know, the ones that are up near the wall and you just pull and push in isolation. It has no freedoms of movement. You just pull and push and use the muscles. There are other exercises later on, the TRX, which most of us know, you hang there and you wobble a bit and you know, it recruits all these other things. Her coach firmly believes that you do 10 second efforts multiple times, increase the degrees of freedom and that will help you rather than extend the, the plank. Yeah, that makes sense. The, the middle one is from uh, just happens to be one of the prescriptions of a triathlete, a high-level triathlete from a federation, some bits to do with the lower body. The upper body uh, would be kind of similar with a mixture. And the right side is just the screening philosophy of the origin projects, you know, Mo Farah, Alberto Salazar, and those sort of people. Uh, just, just as an, a list, you know, it's basic. What I'm trying to cover is the philosophy, the learning process, the way we've come about picking and choosing what we do, uh, 
trying to use a little bit of intelligence along the way and common sense. So I thank you for your, your attention. Question? Raise your hand, please. No question? Please introduce yourself when you ask the question. Alexander Zhukov, Moscow, Russia. Uh, when you mean uh, max power, uh, do you mean uh, how many seconds uh, one exercise? Should it be 10, 30 seconds, or 60, 90 seconds, one set? When I talk about one max power? Max power, yeah. Well, uh, I'm, I'm sure Inigo is going to talk a little about this, but there's a whole range of things. Uh, some people would be more representative of uh, a five-second effort if you're sprinting, or a 10-second effort. Some people might be looking at one drop jump. I'm probably more interested in what happens in repeated bounces, but also we'll look in our screenings at single leg from the bench, 30 second bench, a 30 centimeter bench to a single leg to a hop. Five jumps is what we measure on the right leg, left leg. But there's a whole range of other things related to power. Rate of force development. We all know that you can develop power, but you can develop it slowly or you can develop it very quickly. Sometimes uh, you want to develop it very quickly if you are trying to accelerate on the bike. In swimming, though, we want to develop it, a li I think, a little bit slower than our maximum because we might lose the tension on the water. So rate of force development is probably slightly more important. But I didn't want to get into that too much because, you know, that, that kind of goes a little bit more into the science side. But thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Darren. <laughs>